from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Secret of Glamis Glamis Castle, or one of the most haunted castles in Great Britain, was a talk of ancient Europe during the second half of the 19th century. The castle was connected with tales involving secret passages, hidden prisoners, initiation rites, and shadowy figures seen on the ramparts late at night. The secret was apparently so extraordinary that only three people were ever allowed to know it at one time. The Earl, the Earl's heir after he reached his 21st birthday, and the estate manager known as the Factor. There's many ghosts connected to Glamis Castle, but one of the most unexplainable is what's known as the secret chamber. Uh, it's that of an unknown prisoner held in a secret hidden chamber. According to a correspondent to the journal Notes and Queries, writing in 1908, the mystery was told to the president writer some 60 years ago when he was a boy and it made a great impression to him. The story was and is that in the castle of Glamis is a secret chamber. In this chamber is confined a monster who is the rightful heir to the title and property but who is so unpresentable that it is necessary to keep him out of sight and out of possession. The monster of Glamis has been described as a deformed, hairy, human toad and always terrifying to behold a monster was born into the family he was the heir a creature fearful to behold it was impossible to allow this deformed caricature of humanity to be seen even by their friends his chest an enormous barrel hairy as a doormat his head ran straight into his shoulders and his arms and legs were toy-like now the following story, uh, which is um, appeared in Lord Halifax's recounts of true ghost stories, uh, was given to Lord Halifax by Mrs. Madigan. He, she was wife of the Archbishop of York, and Miss Virginia Gabriel, to whom she refers, was a composer of songs and music. In 1870, we met Miss Virginia Gabriel fresh from a long visit to Glamis and full of the mysteries which had assumed such prominence since the death of our poor brother-in-law in 1865. The chapel had been cleaned and rededicated. And the gossip was that the ghosts were endeavoring to terrify Claude, Lord Strathmore, and his family from making the castle their home. I will try to write down all that Virginia told us, much of which was afterwards confirmed by Lady Strathmore. It appears that after my brother-in-law's funeral, the lawyer and the agent initiated Claude into the family secret. He went from them to his wife and said, My dearest, you know how often we have joked over the secret room and the family mystery. I have been into the room. I have heard the secret. And if you wish to please me, you will never mention the subject to me again. Lady Strathmore was too good a wife not to obey, but she talked freely to other people, and her mother, old Mrs. Oswald Smith, was one of the chief propagators of stories which, of course, lost nothing in the telling. Claude made a good many alterations and improvements at the castle, one being a staircase from the lower hall or crypt, as it was called, to the chapel, 
which had previously been accessible only through the great drawing room. One day, when the family were in London, a man working in, I think, the chapel, came upon a door opening up a long passage. He went some way down it, then became alarmed and went back and told the clerk of the works. Immediately all the work was stopped, and the head man telegraphed to Claude in London and to Mr. Dundas, the lawyer in Edinburgh, both arrived by the earliest possible train and subjected the workman to a severe examination as to what he had or had not seen, the end of it being that he and his family were subsidized and induced to immigrate to Australia. It is unquestionable that for many years after the revelation of the secret, Claude was quite a changed man, silent and moody, with an anxious, scared look on his face. So evident was the effect on him that his son Glamis, when he came of age in 1876, absolutely refused to be enlightened. Virginia further informed me that in several of the bedroom cupboards there were stones with rings in them. Claude converted all these cupboards into coal stores with strongly boarded fronts and ordered them to be kept always full so that no inquisitive visitor might attempt an exploration. She told us a wonderful tale of the first housewarming, a dance in the new dining room in November of 1869. They had all been very merry and dancing, way on to the small hours. The three sets of rooms on the clock landing were occupied by the street fields, who was Lady Strathmore's sister, Mr. and Lady F. Trevanian, Lord Strathmore's sister, and Mr. and Mrs. Monroe from Lindertus. The latter were in the red room, their little boy sleeping in the dressing room, the outer door of which was rather stiff and difficult to open. In the middle of the night, Mrs. Monroe awoke with a sensation as though someone was bending over her. Indeed, I have heard as she felt a beard brush her face. The night light having gone out, she called her husband to get up and find the matches. In the pale glimmer of the winter moon, she saw a figure pass into the dressing room. Creeping to the end of the bed, she felt for and found the matchbox and struck a light, calling out loudly, Cam, Cam, I found the matches. To her surprise, she saw that he had not moved from her side. Very sleepily, he grumbled, What are you bothering about? At that moment, they heard a shriek of terror from the child in the dressing room. Rushing in, they found him in great alarm, declaring that he had seen a giant. They took him into their own room, and while they were quieting him off to sleep, they heard a fearful crash, as though a heavy piece of furniture had fallen. At that moment, the big clock struck four. Nothing more happened, and the next morning Mr. Monroe extracted a reluctant promise from his wife to say nothing about her fright, as the subject was known to be distasteful to their host. However, when breakfast was half over, Fanny Trevanian came down yawning and rubbing her eyes and complaining of a disturbed night. She always slept with a night light and had her little dog with her on the bed. The dog, she said, had awakened her by howling. The night light had gone out and while she and her husband were hunting for matches, they heard a tremendous crash followed by the clock striking four. They were so frightened they could not sleep again. Of course, this was too much for Mrs. Monroe, who burst out with her story. No explanation was offered, and the three couples agreed on the following night to watch in their respective rooms. Nothing was seen, but they all heard the same loud crash and rushed out onto the landing. As they stood there with scared faces, the clock again struck four. That was all, and the noise was not heard again. We did not go to Glamis that year, but with our heads full of these wonderful tales, paid a visit to Tully Allen Castle, a large and comfortable modern house. It was inhabited by a most cheerful old couple, Lord and Lady William Osborne, and there was nothing about it to suggest a ghost. On the night of the 28th of September, I dreamt I was sleeping in the blue room at Glamis, which Addie and I occupied during our memorable and delightful visit in 1862. The dressing room has a well-known trap door and a secret staircase leading to a corner of the drawing room. I dreamt that I was in the park watching some horses when I heard the gong sound for dinner. 
and rushed upstairs in a great hurry, begging the others not to wait for me. In the passage I met the housemaid, coming out of the blue dressing room, with her arms full of rusty bits of iron, which she held out to me. Where did you find those? I asked. She replied that in the cleaning the grate she had seen a stone with a ring in it, which she had raised, and in the hollow space below had found these pieces of iron. I said, I will take them down with me. His lordship likes to see everything that is found in the castle. As I opened the door of the blue room, the thought crossed my mind. They say the ghost always appears if anything is found. I wonder if he will come to me. I went in, and there seated in the armchair by the fire, I saw a huge figure of a man with a very long beard and an enormous stomach, which rose and fell with his breathing. I shook all over with terror, but walked to the fireplace and sat down on the coal box staring at the ghost. Although he was breathing heavily, I saw clearly that it was the face of a dead man. The silence was unendurable, and at last I held up the pieces of rusty iron, saying, Look what I have found, an untruth for the housemaid was the finder. Then the ghost, heaving a deep sigh, said, Yes, you have lifted a great weight off me. These irons have been weighing me down ever since. Ever since when, I asked eagerly, forgetting my alarm in my curiosity. Ever since, eight fourteen eighty six, replied the ghost. At that moment, to my great relief, I heard a knock at my door. That is Caroline, my maid, I thought, coming to dress me. I wonder if she will see this dreadful creature. Come in, I called, and woke up. It was Caroline opening my shutters, and the sun was streaming cheerfully into the room. I sat up in bed and found that my nightgown was quite wet with perspiration. I came downstairs very full of my dream, and still more of the fact, as I believe that although the room was in all other respects exactly like the one I thought I remembered so well, the fireplace was in a different corner. So persuaded was I of this, that when next year I saw the room at Glamis and found that my memory of the dream was right and my waking memory wrong, I could scarcely believe my eyes. I even brought upon myself some ridicule by asking Claude if the fireplace had been changed, which would be neither easy nor likely in a house of that age and with walls of that thickness. The, this part of my dream greatly interested Dr. Ackland and other Oxford Dons as a striking confirmation of the theory that the brain receives impressions which are always accurate when it is undisturbed by outside influences. I wrote my dream, dream down but told it to very few people. A year or two afterwards, Mrs. Wingfield, a daughter of Lord Castletown's, met my brother Eric at a water potty and asked him about my dream. She had an odd experience of her own, which unfortunately I can only relate secondhand, as I have never had the opportunity of meeting her. So far as I could make out, she was staying at Glamis for the first time during the same week, if not on the very same day that we went to Tully Allen. She was occupying the blue room, but had heard none of the stories about Earl Beardy and his crew of ghosts. She went to bed with a usual night light, which was so bright that she read by it before going to sleep. During the night she awoke with a feeling that someone was in the room, and sitting up in bed she saw, seated in front of the fire, a huge old man with a long flowing beard. He turned his head and gazed fixedly at her, and then she saw that although his beard rose and fell as he breathed, the face was that of a dead man. She was not very alarmed, but unfortunately made no attempt to enter into conversation with her visitor. After a few minutes he faded away, and she went to sleep again. Next morning, when Mr. Oswald Smith began to tell her some of the tales of the castle, she said, Let me tell you first what I saw last night. Whether she saw or dreamt it, the coincidence was curious. Nothing came either of her dream or, of, or minds, but some years afterwards, when we were driving from Glamis to Cordegy, my mother asked me if I had ever told my dream to Lady Drathmore. I replied that I had not thought it worth telling, but she insisted on my relating to Lady Strathmore just what I had written here. 
when I came to the date, Lady Strathmore gave a start, and turning to Fanny Trevanion said, Oh, that is too odd. I said, Surely, that isn't the right date. I thought it was fifteen hundred and something. No, she answered. It was in 1486, nearly four hundred years ago. Of course, I may have heard that date at some time, but have no recollection of it. After 1870, we went to Glamis every year, nearly always spending my mother's birthday there. St. Michael was a patron saint of the chapel, people pretending that when it was rededicated, he had been chosen for the purpose of keeping away evil spirits. I generally had a most ghostly little room, King Malcolm's chamber, but never slept there, for my mother was so afraid of waking in the night and felt so nervous when she was alone that at Glamis I always slept with her. We never saw or heard anything, and eager believers in the ghosts affirmed that this was because we had lion blood and the ghosts never appeared to any of the family. My mother's grandmother, Lady Anne Simpson, who was a lion, tried hard to see something and I often found her in a room with her face pressed against the window pane, straining her eyes for a glimpse of the white lady, a most harmless apparition who was supposed to flit about the avenue. One year on our arrival we found the whole house in great excitement as the white lady had been seen by Lady Strathmore, her nieces and Lady Glasgow from different windows at the same moment. The descriptions were exceedingly vague and incoherent. One more tale related to me by old Dr. Nicholson, the Dean of Brecken, I must put down. He said that once, when he was staying at Glamis, he had gone to bed in the room halfway up the winding stair. The door was locked, but he saw a tall figure enter, draped in a long, dark coat fastened at the throat with a clasp. Neither spoke, and the figure disappeared in the wall. The Bishop of Bracken, Dr. Forbes, who was also staying in the castle, was very incredulous about this apparition and teased his friend by saying, Now, Mr. Dean, we all know you are the most persevering beggar in Scotland. I'm sure you brought out your collecting book and laid the ghost by asking him for a subscription. Next night, to the delight of Dr. Nicholson, the provost of Perth, who had joined the party, said he had had a similar mysterious visit the last time he slept in that room. The dean at once hurried him off to the bishop and made him repeat his tale to that skeptical prelate. Bishop Forbes and Uncle Robert Liddell both offered to hold a service of exorcism in the castle, but this was never done. I think Claude would have been afraid to have it. Unquestionably, there is something strange about the place. The chaplain told me that he felt this more and more the longer he lived there. While the factor, Mr. Ralston, a dry, shrewd, hard-headed Scotsman, after he had been initiated into the secret, could never be induced to sleep in the castle. One winter evening, when he had come up for the theatricals, a sudden sand snowstorm came on and the road back to his house was blocked. It appeared impassable. However, he resolutely refused to spend the night on a sofa and insisted on rousing the gardeners and stablemen to dig out a path to his house nearly a mile off outside the park. Lady Strathmore herself told me that she once disclosed to Mr. Ralston her great curiosity about the mystery. He looked earnestly at her and said very gravely, Lady Strathmore, it is fortunate that you do not know it, and can never know it, for if you did you would not be a happy woman. Such a speech from such a man was certainly uncanny. Many years afterwards, in September 1912, I visited Glamis with my daughter Dora for the first time after Claude's death. His son, the present owner, has no objection to talking about the ghost. He and his wife were much interested in my dream and got me to give them a copy of my account of it. Lady Strathmore told me that on her first visit to Glamis after her marriage, she and her husband occupied the blue room. During the night, she dreamt that she saw a big man gazing at her 
from the other side of the bed. Only he was thin, not fat like my ghost. She woke in a great fright and roused her husband, but of course there was nothing there. Two of her children rose the second girl and David the youngest boy. Often see shadowy figures flitting about the castle. They are not alarmed by them, but Rose says she would not like to sleep in the blue room. Figures have been frequently seen by them and by a housemaid in the oak room, which my mother always had, but has now been turned into an extra sitting room. King Malcolm's chamber, the little room where I used to dress, has also been dismantled and thrown into the passage. This is a great improvement, as it provides a better access to the great drawing room and the chapel.